I am Rudolf Reeser, Chair of the Center for World Indigenous Studies Board of Directors. The United Nations decided in its final outcome statement in September 2014 that states, governments, multilateral state organizations and indigenous nations and peoples must take an active part in what is dubbed the post-2015 development agenda. That we have invited four astonishingly good scholars and associate scholars to join us in this dialogue. Heidi Bruce, who has a master's degree, uh, is a CWIS research associate, associate scholar, managing editor of the Fourth World Journal. She's in Orcas Island in Washington State in the United States. John Ani Shertow, who is the editor-in-chief Intercontinental Cry Magazine, also the CWIS Board of Directors member in Manitoba, Canada. Veronica Dauhai, Associate Scholar, Lecturer at Massey University in Aetoria in New Zealand. And Dina Gilio Whitaker, who is a CWIS Research Associate, Associate Scholar, and Freelance Writer, writing for Indian Country Today. So, let us begin. Do you think uh, Fourth World Nations are actually uh, in a position to have an effect uh, locally, regionally, and internationally to quell some of these uh, growing uh, uh, problems? I see the role of Fourth World Nations politically, although not necessarily recognized at this point by states, but as being kind of fulcrum points of leverage um, in a lot of the increasing conflicts around the world. And I think we have a good amount at CWIS where can kind of serving as an intermediary, although they've been recognized as a state, you know, let's say within the United Nations. So that's just one example. There needs to be an element of education, a training component of what does self-determination actually mean? Like when the political framework that we've been working on and several of the papers that we've asserted, uh, instead of just from a human rights-based approach. I think that that message is getting up from the right perspective, but to really um, shift it towards where seems to be there needs to be training not only for states' governments as far as what that looks like, to recognize that involving fourth world nations will behoove them as well on a variety of issues, conflict prevention being one of them, climate is an reason. But also that fourth world nations themselves, leaders, not just their leaders, but um, all fourth world nations, on this notion that they do have this potential political leverage, but what that actually looks like when they are asserting self-determination. So there's thought they have right now. Kia Papa Rudy. And thank you for hosting our Kōrero Tēnā Koto uh, to my other um, co-speakers. It's lovely to meet you. And thank you, Heidi, uh, for that Kōrero. Also, thank you, um, Papa Rudy. I just wanted to pick up on a, um, as said, I'm Veronica Tafai, my iwi or tribe is Ngāti Poro, which is on the east coast of the North Island here of Aotearoa. Um, lovely to be here and join you all. Thank you, Heidi, for that Kōrero and for your question, uh, Papa Rudy. I just wanted to pick up on um, some of the things that you had brought up which speak directly to some of the issues that we're facing here in Aotearoa and particularly with regards to the phase that we seem to be in that, uh, that we've had an agenda for Indigenous um, development which has echoed uh, what has been happening on the international uh, level here um, in Aotearoa, but certainly there's now a shift and that is with regards to what you were mentioning Heidi of really getting down to the nuts and bolts of self-determination and what that might look like but particularly the need to um, embark upon uh, an educational program that might uh, help that might contribute to a greater understanding of what self-determination actually looks like and so um, 
for example, uh, because here in Aotearoa, as like with many other places, there has been such um, a, a, an a tremendous effort put into the call for self-determination and yet on the same hand um, such a huge rejection of that uh, by the colonising governing states, um, our parliament which is here in Wellington, um, really you know not a lot of effort has gone into them actually looking at what the self-determination might actually mean and look like um, for Māori at that governing level. And so while we've had lots of efforts uh, for Māori to be self, um, self-determining at the grassroots level, for example, we have launched our own educational initiatives, we have launched our own language initiatives, um, we have, uh, you know, tried to hold strong into what we call our tikanga or our laws and protocols with regards to our interactions with each other. Um, uh, it has really been those grassroots movements at the community level um, where we have been realising and really getting the feel of what self-determination um, is like as opposed to at that national level. What we've just had recently though in the last few months here in Aotearoa is that our Waitangi Tribunal, um, which is a tribunal that was established a few decades ago to look into breaches of our Treaty of Waitangi, uh, um, their most recent report, which w which looked into the claims of one of our tribes from um, up north, has said that indeed we did not cede sovereignty, that Māori did not cede, cede sovereignty, where for the past 175 years, uh, the governing of our country by a you know, colonising state entity has been predicated on that. And so now has really come the crunch time in terms of right. So there's going to be this awareness within Aotearoa uh, and wider New Zealand society that um, Māori did not cede sovereignty. What does that immediately mean for our governing, uh, for you know, for our um, governing structures and systems? And while um, you know, and while uh, there has been that recognition, there will be a huge rejection of it. There's a real urgency now to actually then look at well, what are our own systems, uh, what are our own knowledges specifically around our self determination and what it means to be uh, politically um, self determining. And so, really, it was just to pick up there on your point, um, Heidi, that you made about. Uh, education, because I think in a lot of the um, documents, and this isn't to be uh, too critical, but I think in a lot of, of the documents um, around uh, what's happened with the United Nations, the discussion what this agenda might be, that there's a lot of that we need to recognise uh, traditional knowledge systems and cultures. However, uh, I know here in Aotearoa there's this huge urgency to actually protect and revitalise what those traditional knowledges uh, might be. Um, because, for example, I think while there is talk about the need to uh, recognise traditional knowledges for their um, value and worth, of course, that's a given, is that also there is, um, you know, there needs to be recognition of the massive damaging effects of colonisation upon those traditional knowledges. And so in terms of a development agenda for 2000, uh, beyond 2015, there really needs to be um, a huge focus and an urgency put upon revitalise, revitalising those knowledges and protecting those knowledges and really bringing back those knowledges um, so that we may have them and know them and feel them and, and, and be able to, um, you know, be able to really start to operate operationalise them from our own distinct uh, knowledge bases. I'll just stop there because I don't want to go on and on, but um, that's just the first thing I would... I would say, yes. From Heidi's comments, I took this notion that there are enormous numbers of, or growing numbers of conflicts around the world and there are virtually no mechanisms uh, for dealing with conflicts between indigenous nations and states governments. It's primarily between states governments and indigenous peoples. If I understand correctly what you're saying, uh, Heidi, uh, would it be accurate to say for both of you that that uh, that those are sort of the key elements that is a indigenous nations taking the initiative uh, politically and uh, uh, in terms of traditional knowledge and also dealing with uh, very serious 
uh, growing conflicts between states, governments, uh, and uh, indigenous nations. Uh, Heidi, do you have a response to that, a brief one? I just said that yes, that I would agree with that d distillation of, of my comment at least, and then I'll defer to Veronica. So, um, yes, certainly, certainly, yes, I absolutely agree. And even to add on to that, uh, in terms of what you were saying, Heidi and Papa Rudy, with regards to conflict resolution. So another example of that being that, of course, within Māori traditional knowledges, we have our own conflict resolution processes. We have our own um, systems in terms of um, dialogue for the purposes of attaining peace or peace agreements. And so, yeah, there needs to be some priority put upon uh, not only acknowledging those, but revitalising those and um, getting some, uh, putting some efforts into connecting with our elders that have those knowledges so that they can be appreciated as a system that can be, um, that's an option in terms of how it is that we um, address, current, address current conflict. But yes, yeah, this is an example. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Papuridi. John. You're the editor-in-chief of Intercontinental Cry magazine. It has for more than 10 years been reporting on uh, events in all over the world. Well, I think there's uh, dozens of trends around the world uh, with regard to uh, indigenous rights, uh, specifically uh, the conflicts that we face with governments, corporations, non-governmental organizations, paramilitary groups, and organized, um, say, for, for, for lack of a better word, settler populations um, who are averse to indigenous peoples. Um, and there is an ever-present and perhaps growing trend um, of um, states taking comprehensive legislative assaults aimed at uh, eradicating indigenous rights. Um, we've seen that in Canada, Brazil, um, India to some extent um, and elsewhere around the world. Um, but I think perhaps the most important trend is the revitalization movements with indigenous nations around the world um, working to secure their languages, uh, reclaim their lands, um, and restore a lot of the history and perspective and understanding and, and knowledge um, that has been lost or degraded um, throughout this colonial experience. Um, but there are many other uh, very specific trends, for instance, with the climate change movement and the consolidation of power among environmentalists, um, there is a growing trend of uh, indigenous rights violations taking place with developments of green projects, such as solar, wind, and uh, hydrothermal energy projects um, around the world. And uh, the, for instance, just even just recently, the um, um, uh, the big uh, environmentalist Greenpeace openly and confidently violated um, the Nazca lines in Peru for the sake of a for the sake of a publicity stunt. Um, but there are many other grievous violations of, uh, of rights as, as well around the world. Um, but those are perhaps the most important ones. And with regard to the um, development agenda that is being proposed, um, I think there is a great deal of potential for uh, a, a lot of positive outcomes, not short term, but long term, because of um, the uh, the need for more education on, on the local and, and state levels. Um, but it is going to be highly contingent on the amount of effort that we put into it as fourth world nations to foster the healthy relationship that the uh, agenda expresses. Uh, and that's with long term education initiatives uh, and through uh, political vig vigilance on the local, national, and international levels. Thank you, John. Uh, Dina, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on this. I, I hear us talking about global, we, uh, global effects and global issues, but really, shouldn't we be talking about what happens on the ground, people being fed, people being uh, housed, uh, people having a good life? Well, that's a, a really big question. And I think um, as I was listening, I, I, there was not a lot that I could add to that 
but in a sort of, sort of overall um, picture, what you're asking really speaks to the immense diversity of indigenous peoples globally and how there is not a monolithic indigenous people. And um, I mean, with thousands of fourth world nations in existence, I mean, you have that many um, particularities uh, with regard to their needs. And I mean, if you are, you know, uh, in Xochicotla, you've got a, one set of problems. If you are Rohingya in Burma, you've got another set of problems. And, and in those contexts, for example, these are people who are talking about survival. So self-determination for them may have a completely different meaning than it does for um, Maori in, in Aotearoa or than it does for Colville in Washington State. So that's something that that needs to be always, uh, it, you know, in the forefront in terms of talking about indigenous issues. Um, if you are um, a Pacific Islander from Kiribati right now, your survival is all about climate change. So how you uh, you know, what your problems, what you perceive your problems to be are going to be very different than what the Rohingya in uh, Burma perhaps are are looking at. So, um, so climate change, yes, I think that's a huge one depending on where you're at, um, although I think that it's uh, universal in terms of the way the resources are being affected, that's connected to traditional knowledges, resource protection, land protection, and conflict, all of these things are connected. But I think that depending on where you're from as an indigenous person, your issues are going to be different. Well, I understand. And stay there for a moment, because I think what you've touched on is, is the diversity of indigenous peoples, but our conversation so far has shown a lot of commonality between uh, interests of indigenous nations at, say, the regional, state, and international level. Don't we have a problem uh, trying to advance those interests, the ones that you've just described, at the international level? Uh, many of these nations are very small. Uh, virtually none of them have the capital necessary to uh, influence states or international bodies. Yet we're talking about very large and complex problems that have local implications. But if we saw, uh, is it possible for, say, the Rohingya to, to, in Burma to solve their problem if they only work at the local level? Can, do they have to work at any other level? Yeah, I think that they do. And I think that the the problems are, and, and maybe it depends. Maybe it depends on the particular problems. But I think that there, this movement, work moving toward working within the international system is precisely because of the ineffectiveness of working at local levels. In other words, we have to do both. I think that indigenous peoples are realizing that um, to rely on the benevolence of the hegemon, you might say in you know academic terms, is is like you know the chicken guarding. I mean the 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 fox guarding the hen house, and so there's got to be other mechanisms that they can utilize that go beyond that, because clearly what's been happening hasn't been working too well. Thank you very much, Dina, and thank you, Heidi, and John Anishirtau, and Veronica Tawai. <clears throat> Let me just close with a, a quote from Galina Anagarva of the Indigenous Peoples International Center for Policy Research and Education, where she says, the world can still benefit from our knowledge by including us in the journey for the next 15 years. 
and we want this to be an equal partnership. We do not want to be beneficiaries. I want to thank you all and thank you for participating. And goodbye.